do you start? This is Victoria Bellinger, and my name is Phyllis Foreman, and I curated the show. Um, I had met, uh, I'll just tell you how that came about. I had met Victoria many years ago at a Friends of Fire uh, event at the Unitarian Church, and I admired her work. And I went back to her house to pick out some pieces to purchase for friends. And um, when I entered her home, uh, there was an array of artwork, as you see here. And it went on and on. And she invited me to go out to the garage. And in the garage, there was also um, a multitude of pieces on display. And of course, it was very hard to choose. But I was really um, impressed by uh, how prolific she was and how talented she was. So from there, she be, was an acquaintance, and I would see her here and there over the years. And when she became a member of the gallery, I got to see her work in group shows here, and pretty much I always wanted to see more. So um, I talked to Linda Rossi, the president of the gallery, about having a solo exhibition of um, Victoria's work and how we might be able to do that, and Linda had suggested, why don't we apply for a grant? through the Staten Island Arts. So this exhibition is made possible by a grant through the Staten Island Arts. Um, and we got the grant, and, and then when I was able to design the show and curate it. So that's how that came about. <laughs> so thanks to Linda and SI Arts and Victoria. So I think um, what we all wanna know <laughs> is where these images come from and um, how maybe you started out making faces, what attracts you to faces, and how you um, translate them into your medium of clay, and more currently, uh, post-it note drawings. And I know one thing I can quote Victoria as saying is when she makes art, it brings her joy. <laughs> Well, I've always made art. I didn't have a choice in the matter. It just, um, my mother tell, told me that when I was about two years old, I used to sit at the kitchen table and bite out or rip out pieces of American cheese into shapes <laughs> and say, well, look at this and look at that. And then I, always received art materials when I was a child uh, for birthdays, etc. cetera. Um, once in a while, I wish that I would get a pretty dress or something, but <laughs> <laughs> it was art materials because everybody knew that that's what I had to do. Um, it was almost survival. I, I started working in uh, pen and ink as I got older. I, I didn't have to decide what I was going to do in my life. Uh, there was no choice. Even if intellectually I would have preferred doing something else, uh, I, I had to do art because I always had to do it. In, in school, when I should have been listening, I was drawing a, a person next to me or whatever. And then my memories, um, I had to take the subway. I, I lived in the Bronx for a while uh, and in my teen years. And I would draw the people on the subway, those that weren't looking at me, of course. <laughs> uh, many who were asleep tired, um, coming home from a hard um, night of work. I found that satisfying to draw pictures of them. Well, when I got older and I, it was time to go to college, my parents sent me to uh, Goddard College, which was a tiny college in Vermont. And you could take whatever you wanted. You could take piano lessons or anything. So I took art, and it was a very free sort of a thing. So I just hitchhiked around the countryside drawing people. That was <laughs> a lot of fun. <laughs> 
And um, I, I only spent three months or three or four months there because they had a work study program. And uh, I needed to find a job and uh, I think my father helped me find it. Uh, working in uh, Queens, at the mental hospital part. I, I don't remember the name. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was to show the patients how to use the material. Then it was time for me to go back to some college. So I was accepted at the Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, yeah, Temple. And so I did artwork there. Were you always making faces back then? I, I think I might have had a couple of bodies attached. <laughs> <laughs> But I was drawing. I wasn't doing clay then. I was drawing and painting. Mm. And um, I found the teachers awfully old-fashioned and stuffy. <laughs> so I went back to my um, place where I lived, my, my room where I lived, and I would paint there. So I, I didn't get much art instruction. <laughs> um, and while I was there, my mother called me on the telephone and she said, some Norwegian captain wants you to go to the Orient, to Hong Kong and Japan and stuff. <laughs> and I had always dreamed of going to the Far East and Hong Kong was first on my list. So um, I had three days in which to board the ship. So I threw some clothes in a suitcase. I, I, I left my easel and everything else, my paintings, there in that room in Philadelphia. I don't know what happened to them. Had all my hair cut off. I had long hair at the time, and I got on the ship. I was told that I was to be a mess girl, which meant that I was to serve nine Norwegian officers three times a day, uh, their meals. So I did that. But everybody except the laundryman on the ship was Norwegian, and I didn't speak a word of Norwegian. <laughs> so we had some little um, to-dos about that. The ship that, uh, traveled to many countries, Japan, Hong Kong, Manila, the Celebes Islands, um, islands all around in the Far East. It was and a cargo ship? It was a cargo ship. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of passengers upstairs, but I never saw them or knew them. Mm -hmm. uh, they were separate from the workers. But I was glad to be a worker, except that I would have liked more time to do my art. So I used to, when we were in ports, different ports, I would quickly take my hidden sketchbook and start sketching the workers who were taking the cargo on or off the ship. And this went on for quite a while, until maybe two months later, the first mate of the ship came down from his quarters upstairs, and he asked me, are your drawings worth thousands of dollars? <laughs> 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 and I laughed, and I said, no, they're not worth anything. I, I just do this. And he said, well, you're making the ship lose thousands of dollars because the cargo workers are watching you sketch instead of unloading and loading the cargo. And he said, you know, there's a plank there and you don't have a passport. We can have you walk the plank. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> But of course, I, I couldn't stop drawing. And uh, I used to go ashore when we were in port uh, with the ordinary seamen. I chose not to go with the um, 
you know, the Office. upper echelons. Mm -hmm. And they go to the bars in the Far East. Uh, so I went with them. They took me. And when I was there, um, I, uh, I would sketch the attractive girls and th they would go do their business. Mm -hmm. Then finished, we'd go back to the ship. Sometimes it was very late and it was hard for me to get up early in the morning to serve these <laughs> officers, but I had to do that. Um, How many women were on the ship with you? There was a woman who took care of the passengers upstairs. A woman uh, from Australia who was married to the first mate, but she was upstairs. But she'd come downstairs and uh, say to me things sometimes like, I saw you were ashore last night and, and you were touching this little child. You're sure to get syphilis. <laughs> and every time I, um, not every time, but many times when I went ashore, I'd see her the next day and she'd tell me uh, I would be getting some disease. <laughs> and she said, also, you'd better watch out for the tsetse fly. And um, you'd better look all around instead of sleeping at night. You know, this tsetse fly could <laughs> really give you a bad disease. So she half scared me. She tried scaring me. Uh, Diane wanted to know what time period this was. Like was this, what years, do you remember? Yes. Um, I was 19, 1955-3. And I only found out um, somewhere during the trip why I had gotten the job because I had been actually my father's friend had told me to go down to this uh, shipping office down by Battery Park in, in New York and see a captain, um, whatever his name was. And <laughs> I don't know. I, so I went down to see him. I went to Battery Park. I told him, well, I, I'm here because um, I thought I might like to work on, on a ship. And he said, all right, I'll take your name and address, write it on a piece of paper. And I never thought that I would hear from him. I did. There was this telephone call to my mother who knew nothing about it. My parents were separated and it was my father who started this all. Do you think that, that your experiences on the ship uh, influenced your artwork in any way, or was it just another way to, uh, you know, spark your curiosity and gather faces, or? You know, I, it's very hard for me to answer that, but I must say that certain places in the Far East, oh, Singapore, uh, see, this was a big ship, and we couldn't go to port most of the time, so we would, they called it lie out or lay out in stream in, 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 in the water like a mile or so mm -hmm. off. The skyscape, let's call it, you know, looking up at, uh, up, up at the sky. The colors were colors that I had never seen before. They were just really, striking my imagination, sure. I, 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 the colors and, and shapes sometimes. And your work obviously is very colorful, a lot of it. And but I couldn't work in color no. during right. the whole trip. Right. Mm -hmm. But perhaps you've internalized all those experiences. Do you mind if I ask you a question from oh, the go audience? Right ahead. Okay. Someone asked about your training and your art school, which you spoke about, but they wanted to know about some of your images 
why deformities, which there is interpretation of some of your stuff, and your life experiences, are they reflected, I imagine, in what we're seeing in the gallery today? Which is, I know when I've spoken to Victoria in the past, she very often brings up the, the traveling to the Far East. So what can you tell us about some of the work in the gallery that, um, yeah, and your, how it reflects your life experiences or? Well, it's hard to know how it transformed itself. Um, I think I was interested in relationships, which you can see in mm. many of the drawings. The, the differences in, and beauty in people's physiognomy, their differences, uh, but the beauty in it that I've always found. Because so much of the art show is clay pieces also, um, which some of them show relationships where we have the heads that are communicating with each other, the singers. Um, he wants to know when you got into your ceramic uh, phase, because you spoke about how you were drawing all that time and then you um, became a ceramicist. So when did that occur? When my son was born, I married and my son was born in uh, 1960. Um, and I wanted to be home with him. I was brought up with um, hired people to take care of me uh, while my parents were out working. My mother was a fashion illustrator. She worked in Manhattan and she'd be gone many hours. And I said, if I ever had a child of my own, I wanted to bring him or her up be with that child. So I was fortunate that I uh, was um, given the opportunity to illustrate children's books at that point. That was in about 1962, I'd say, or 63. I illustrated many books for a living. It was fine because I loved to draw and I liked to draw children. But it wasn't totally satisfying. And I felt the need to work in three dimensions. Just a feeling I had. So I guess it was in the 80s that I had the opportunity, a friend of mine, Tom Kendall, this is all in Manhattan. I was living in Manhattan then. He um, was a teacher at Pace University downtown, but he had a loft and he was doing some clay work there. And he said, you can come and do clay work. And he invited some other people also. And he taught us how to sculpts out of clay. Uh, that was wonderful. After that, a few years later, um, this was no longer possible, um, but I was in love with clay. So I registered at uh, Hunter College in New York. And I, I finished up and got my degree in art education. I was a lousy teacher, though. <laughs> <laughs> that was wasteful. I, I was told, you know, don't get the degree in art, fine art, because you're going to need to earn a living, which I always have to do anyway, no matter which way or what. I, I registered, I finished my courses in Hunter as an older student then. And my son was in college by that time. Then I took a clay course. And I took that clay course, I don't know, maybe 20 times the same course 
This is where I met my husband at. And he was taking the same one over and over. But there was a... <laughs> Um, there was a whole bunch of us who were doing that. Uh, a wonderful, wonderful woman who was um, head of the ceramics department, Susan Peterson was her name, and she wrote some books. So um, for years, that's where I did clay, and uh, the kilns were large gas kilns. and. You get a different look from the glazes and, and the clay, from the gas kilns, the big fire, fiery gas kilns, than from an electric kiln. So that was wonderful, and I, I worked at whatever job I could get, um, and I, I got a job at the Social Security Administration, daytime, and I go nighttime to do clay work at Hunter. So a number of the pieces here I made at Hunter College. Victoria, I have a question for you. Or actually two. How many things did you lose in the kiln over the years? <laughs> I have no idea. You were on a Norwegian ship. How did you get away with no passport? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, did you not? He wants yeah. to ask about your passport on the Norwegian ship. The first meeting. I think you said something you had no you. passport. Well, I didn't have time to get a passport. <laughs> 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 Things were different. I had to just get on the ship and, <laughs> and feed these officers. I <laughs> um, Victoria, at Hunter College, where you met Edmund, who also does ceramics, as we can see, uh, you also did collaborations with him occasionally. None of those pieces are in the show. That's for a future show. But um, how often did you collaborate and how did that come about? Well, we didn't collaborate too often um, because he was in the, um, the wheel room, we called oh, okay. it. Uh -huh. And I was in the hand building room. Right. Uh, I didn't do the wheel. I just uh -huh. liked hand building. Right. And um, at one point we thought, well, let's collaborate a little bit. So yeah. we made a few pieces together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, wasn't there a mouse there in that thing? There was a mouse. there a mouse there? Oh, yes, yes, <laughs> I don't <laughs> like them. <laughs> <laughs> So you, you talked about relationships in your work and, um, and your interest in faces regardless of their beauty or lack of beauty. Um, and I, when I look at a lot of your artwork, I really see your beautiful face in a lot of them. And I see Edmund's face and I see relationships um, in there. Um, and I, I love the variety of expression because they're not all smiling and lovey-dovey. A lot of them have some real scowls <laughs> and <laughs> temptuous looks. So well, that you could just imagine the narrative. Um, I think that your post-it drawings are very narrative. I mean, I'm making it up, you know, my narrative. But I just find them so compelling that the variety of expression um, that you get it through your color and your line. Um, but are you in these pictures? Not consciously. <laughs> no, I, I, I probably am subconsciously. I think all artists do themselves, even Picasso mm -hmm. did himself. I mean, you can't help it, because uh, I mean, you wash your face and, face and look in the mirror, <laughs> you're a guy you shave in, <laughs> right, right. in the mirror. So, this is subconscious. I never intended to put either one of us in. It, it, most of my work comes from the subconscious. Right. What's, what's lying there, festering. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Um, what artist do you admire? Um, 
I love so many, it would be unfair to name them, but I'll, I'll name a few anyway. Matisse, Picasso, Walt, or Pan is just so... Paul Clay, I know you've mentioned. Oh, Paul Clay for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he was wonderful. Yeah, second question. Uh, what, what's your, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, do you get up each morning and work, or do you just do it when you feel like it? On, on a day-to-day -day basis. basis yeah. your, he wants uh, to know your work right? schedule. How do you, your... I'm a very disorganized person. <laughs> 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 and I don't have a schedule. I've always tried to um, squeeze in the work whenever I could. When I, when I see an opening that nobody's around me demanding things of me. I don't have piles of letters and stuff to go through. Um, or in the middle of that, I, I just um, grab a piece of paper for collage and put it in a book to continue another time. It's really what I would like to do. Do you work on more than one thing at a time? Um, do I work on more than one single thing at a time? Um, I would say yes, if you don't mind, because <laughs> if having been in Victoria's house so often, there's a lot of works in progress all over the house. <laughs> oh. And her, if you could see in these sketchbooks that they're at different stages of development. So it looks as if she starts something and then she goes around and then ultimately it's finished at some point. But there's a lot of work in progress in her home currently. Thank you. Right, that's the way I work. Victoria, <laughs> yeah. I notice when you're sitting here and we're just hanging out, you're working. Whatever, I think whenever the opportunity becomes available, whether it's at home or sitting, at, sitting in the gallery, gallery sitting, or just listening to someone else, or I see her sketching. So yeah, you're right. It's a it's compulsion. I, I just yeah. have, since I've been two years old, I, I've had to work. And whether it's, um, I, I stopped doing clay work, or maybe about two years ago, three years ago, um, because it's more involved. I have to go down to the basement, make sure the clay isn't too hard, and um, then after making it, I have to fire it, and then I have to glaze it. It's a whole long process. I stopped doing the clay, although I miss it. You know, I find as, as I get older, I have less energy and time to, to work. Uh, whereas sketching or a drawing, um, I can make little drawings and then finish them later, put different ones together later. I, I find that a convenient way of working at my time of life. No, well, my father described me as a restless person. <laughs> and that's why he managed to help me get this job working on the ship. <laughs> uh, if I get the chance, I will put them together as I see it should be a, a whole. But will you work like the, particularly like the brick pieces? I know she recently said to me that she loves a, to see a nice piece of brick. and <laughs> She <laughs> wishes she could still work with it. You were attracted to the stones and the bricks. Now, was that a certain period in your life, or did you always go back and forth, like with the bricks, or was that just a certain time period? Well, I probably was always attracted to that, but I didn't have the opportunity until, because I lived in Manhattan for so many years, until I came here to Staten Island. Yay. And then I was able to walk down to the waterfront, like by, by Alice Austin House, mm -hmm. and pick up bricks, stones, artifacts, wh whatever I could find that um, attracted me so that I could incorporate them in mm -hmm. pieces. Right. 
And then you have like the um, painted pieces. There's a very uh, beautiful display in the middle of the gallery where everything's painted, mm -hmm. brightly colored. But then you have in the front of the gallery things that look more aboriginal. Mm -hmm. They're very different. They could be two different artists. So did you do like aboriginal pieces yeah, does at your one style point? like evolve over time or do you just switch back and forth between styles based on what piece you're working on? I probably switched back and forth. <laughs> when I lived in Manhattan, I especially I had the opportunity to go and visit galleries and especially the Metropolitan Museum that has everything. Mm. And I've always been attracted to Aboriginal art but other art too. I, I don't know where it comes from. I, I, I just um, work with what I have. You know, I, if I don't have uh, proper tools for one thing, I'll, I'll, I'll do another thing. Mm -hmm. And what comes out of my brain, I don't know. <laughs> So I can tell you that uh, in Victoria's house now, the unfinished sculptures are um, detergent bottles, plastic bottles that she oh, then yeah. puts a clay head on top and she affixes them in different ways and then she paints the bottles or collages the bottles. So none of those are in this show, um, but that's for the future because she, we recently ordered a drill bit and there's some technical technical aspects between we ordered glue that was going to work. She's been experimenting with what adhesives to use. So that's a, her progress right now is a little slower doing that. But eventually you're going to see all these amazing bottle wow. pieces. They're really wild. Wow. So that's, I think, you know, you're not walking around picking up bricks anymore. But in her <laughs> household, yeah. like she says, whatever's in front of her, she's conscientious like I am with recycling and stuff so she doesn't want to throw that bottle out right, so she's right. like I'll make a sculpture right. <laughs> That's cool. yeah they're great yeah. Right. and they're lightweight <laughs> That's cool. I wanted to ask about the, the pieces that have multiple faces to them mm. what's the um, you know what's your inspiration for those Lenny I don't know <laughs> I mean, I think most of us have within us different personalities, aspects. I think we're not just one face, even though it looks like that. But our brains are different aspects, yeah, so that we can work one way or another way or combine ways of working. People love the multiple faced ones, and I, I know a woman gallery member Marilyn uh, actually purchased one of your pieces and she said it has the most faces on it <laughs> and she counted like 10 faces on it you know because some of them are a little you, know, you have to really look for them mm -hmm. and she was just fascinated that it was like this one has the most faces <laughs> <laughs> well I always thought that the backs of people's heads were not awfully interesting <laughs> And so, if you have a, a sculpture that's frontal, has a face on the front, it should have another face on the back <laughs> to make it, so you could turn it around and see something different, not get bored all the time looking mm -hmm. at the same thing. <laughs> when I'm awfully low, when the world is cold, I will feel a glow just thinking of you. So it's interesting, on one hand, you did illustration work, which is very literal. You're telling a story, you're illustrating a story, an anecdote. And then your own work is very subjective and personal and non-referential. So there are two separate things that you did. Um, did you feel constrained by having to illustrate a story when you did books? Well, no, the illustration work that I did for the children's books they weren't my books. I, I was unable to write a, a book I, for whatever reason. I did try. I had to follow a script, develop a character or characters 
to, to draw and keep those characters in mind. So it was not fully mine and not fully satisfying to me all those years. I mean, there are book illustrators that are mainly book illustrators. They love to do it, and this is their means of expression. Uh, but for me, um, I liked doing it, uh, but it wasn't from the inside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have a list of those books that you illustrated? We do. Actually, you could, you could, you'll be able to see them in the gallery. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. You could find them on Google also. About and 30 books, I think. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. And Victoria was using the name, uh, her, her first married name was Luria. So the Victoria Luria. Yeah, I brought a few books. Oh, she did. Oh, good. Yeah, Edmund, do you have those books that Victoria brought? Yeah, I don't have all the books. Some of the books that I have are up in my attic. It's very hard for me to get up there. There were plans to go up there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Victoria, your mother was a fashion illustrator. What was your father? Oh, my friend Gary was asking yeah, your mom. Your mother was a fashion illustrator. Was she supportive of you, and what was your father's profession, and was he supportive of you? Well, my father uh, taught philosophy at Brooklyn College until uh, politically um, he was out of favor and he lost his job. Really? So then he had to oh, get funny. anything he oh, could. <laughs> <laughs> He's putting it right out there. Hello. <laughs> he was a communist, Ed said. <laughs> He, well, they called him a communist, and <laughs> he felt that he was a Marxist. He followed. He believed in Karl Marx, who oh, was a, oh, a, a, a philosopher. Oh, yeah. philosopher. And oh. they based communism on some of the writings of Karl Marx, but communism was a political uh, right. form of government or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and it viewpoint. distorted the Marxist point of view. Oh. When you, Evil. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't know if he was a communist. He was a, a dear person to me, no matter what he was. <laughs> it was the Somebody McCarthy era. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, all kinds of people, um, good people lost their jobs, their living during that time. Out in Hollywood, um, writers, actresses, actors, many of them lost their jobs. Um, because of, for some reason, it was so long ago, but I remember the name of the president of the college who did all that damage. His name was Harry Gideons. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how one person can create such havoc, yeah. you know? Yeah, what happened to freedom of speech? Wasn't there freedom of speech back then? <coughs> uh, 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 there was no freedom of speech, no. she's saying. Where no. was the freedom of speech back then? Uh, no, there, there wasn't. It was under debate, at least, oh. yeah. Still yeah. 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 Yeah, still under debate. Show the world how to smile. I could be glad all of the while. I could change the gray skies. To so I wanted to share. Um, <laughs> Victoria hasn't seen this in a while. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> this is Victoria's uh, bag that she carried these three sketchbooks in. And um, I was privileged enough for her to give me this bag so that I could go through the sketchbooks. And we had a lot of the sketches framed. The ones on top on display are double-sided. And therefore, we didn't frame them. They're just in these loose things. Because um, as she works compulsively, she was creating this large sketchbook, and she just kept going and didn't regard that she was putting things on both sides of the same piece of paper. <laughs> um, so, uh, but she would carry this satchel around with her books, and from what she told me, unfortunately she was going to a lot of doctor's offices, and as you wait interminably in those rooms, she was making these beautiful drawings. Um, so that was her work habit and it still is so I will return her sketchbooks soon but <laughs> she has replaced them <laughs> um, but that's the uh, evolution of the sketchbooks you see one lying flat then the more evolved uh, more in t detailed one and then the largest detailed one
Yeah. I definitely see some of the imagery and the illustrations that sure. is relevant for the sculptures. Yeah. He sees the same, your, your style in the books as he does on the walls. Well, you can't escape from yourself. That's the problem, even if you'd like to. <laughs> <laughs> did I miss anyone's question? Oh, Cynthia. Um, did you like lay down and then all of a sudden an idea or a feeling came over you and then you got up and you started working on a, a project? I mean, it was so so intense. It, it just like you couldn't wait for the next day. You just said, I'm, I'm getting up. I'm, I, I don't care what time it is. I'm going to do it. You ever felt that way? I, I think not. I mean, I can't say for sure, no, but... Um, when I would wake up many times, I uh, couldn't wait to get back t to, to either clay or drawing or painting, whatever right. I was doing. But I don't know if there was a particular vision or anything that I had from a dream, say. I, I'm not conscious of that. Diane's this in this collecting I'm, stage. Yeah. I'm not collecting. I'm not like, you know, into the arts. I, mean, if I, I do photography, most of you guys know. So it's like, yeah, yeah but, you know, one of these days I'll come up and like, maybe I'll take that photo, I'll put that shell on top of it, or right. put that brick on that, you know, or something. But I, I'm not there yet. I mean, I don't know if you, I guess I just, what's your advice? Just to, <laughs> to start and get the glue and just start doing something and see what it looks like and then continue. And this winter. She going. needs some advice from you how Diane's been collecting uh, natural materials like you do, and she wants to take the next step and create art with it, maybe incorporating her photography. Um, I see some people with, 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 uh, she wants to know where you get your fearlessness. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I didn't think it was fearlessness. I just did it. Um, <laughs> You have to just do it, Diane. Just do it, yeah. You just know, do it. Like. Some glue and squat. Yeah. See what it looks like. That may be a good idea for a workshop with you, Diane. Yeah, that would yeah. take everybody. Bring in your shit and let's do it. Oh, you say bring your shit. That's the creativity. Well, you, you made me think of a question because um, how do you ever s start something and not like it and trash it, get rid of it? Well, you throw it away, I guess. Yeah. You don't yeah, have to. I feel like if I, I don't, if you don't mind me answering, I feel like it's okay to make mistakes. Kind of like with the just do it. Do it and yeah, and know, if you don't like it, it's okay. Back. Yeah, start over because that's. I feel like that's how you learn. Your yeah, the important thing is to do it. To do it. Yeah. And once it's and done, that, everything can't be great. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. You have to have a certain standard mm -hmm. that you reach, personal standard, mm -hmm. in order to. Uh, and you're the editor of your work because what exactly. what remains is your voice. Right, right. So if you don't want that voice in, then the don't scary part let is it come out. Putting it out into the world. Right. right. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when you get to the point where you just say, you know what, here it is. That's the scary part. I found you just in time. Before you came, my time was running low. Oh, I, I just want to say that. If it wasn't for Phyllis, I wouldn't be sharing because I, I just stay in my own cocoon and I work and um, I, I never really looked for fame and fortune. I, I just uh, did artwork in one form or another um, because it presented itself to me. and. Uh, I would see things like uh, a bottle cap, say, and I think I could use this somewhere, yeah. or uh, bottles now, and uh, it was bricks when I could get a hold of bricks, <laughs> uh, stones, uh, whatever. So I, I just want to point out that the drawings are on post-it notes. I forgot to mention that, so that's something that I, I guess you were attracted to the shape, the colors. She uses a variety of colorful post-it notes. And I guess some day you must have encountered a pack of post-it notes <laughs> and thought, oh. <laughs> yeah, I, and um, they're small, so you can take them with you. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that was important, to be able to move around with them. Was there any question that I missed yeah. on the card? Uh, well, 
with your uh, pieces mm -hmm. on the things, they're almost like quilts to me. Mm -hmm. Short stories in different squares. That's how I perceive them. How do you perceive them when you look at them? Well, that's a very interesting observation. Um, they could be quilts. Yeah. It's like in the old days mm -hmm. when women would make squares yeah. and colorful things and put them together that we now consider works of art. Absolutely. We hang on the walls of museums. And I, I hadn't thought of that, but that's a very interesting thought. So we did uh, take, make t-shirts out of a couple of uh, Victoria's drawings, and they're available if you want to order them if you don't have the right size. And we're, the money we're going to use to make a catalog of her work. Um, because the grant didn't cover, I had wanted to do that, but I didn't get enough grant money. But there was a brilliant idea of my friend Janet's to uh, put her images on a t-shirt, and they really work. So I could, I don't know if anyone saw Frank Stella had done all those quilts, had his artwork made into quilts, and rugs actually, there were rugs. But it would be great to have a quilter <laughs> do one of your pages, wow. <laughs> and you had a question? Yeah, yeah, so all these post-it notes before you assembled them, were they like in order or you just sort of picked and choose? How did you arrive at certain these numbers of post-it notes in one frame? Was that predetermined? So did you um, start with just one post-it note and then decide to put them together or did you put them together and then draw on them? No, I made many post-it notes seemingly unrelated oh, um, at different times uh -huh. mm -hmm. and then I decided maybe I could put them together um, because they were so small <laughs> so and you can see um, in the uh, case here you can see a little bit of the evolution uh -huh. so some of them the book that's open facing you those are complete drawings but she might then take them out and put them on a bigger sheet of paper. Uh -huh. It's really the artist's prerogative. And because they're on post-it notes, uh, they really unstick. <laughs> so when we had them framed, we had to more permanently glue them. But they're really not glued. They're just posted it on. So they are movable, you know. Do you store them stuck on papers, I guess? Or do you store them by colors? Or, you know, they're not stored. As they're individual pieces, pieces, but they are on the They're pieces. just in those books. That's what she, so she pieces. Yeah, yeah, they're just Very sketchbooks. Pieces. Yeah, they're not any. There's nothing because separate. The, the ones I'm doing now are probably different in some way than these, um, as I change or as my brain changes. Um. If you're feeling fancy free, come wander through this world with me. Well, Victoria is a very prolific artist, just so you know, and um, this really is the tip of the iceberg, what you're seeing here. And she does have a lot of work still in her home and garage and basement, whether they're completed works or in-progress works. However, she is no longer doing the clay, except as assemblage of the clay pieces that exist onto bottles and stuff. Yeah, and I, I need to get somebody, I would pay them for it, to drill holes in in um, rocks, rocks and uh, bricks and yeah, uh, you, you know imagine. things like that. I've been we bought the drill bits. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, but we don't have the driller. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have to there's there's that old, old song on drill ye terriers drill. Mm -hmm. If any of you can remember, well, you're not old enough. <laughs> <laughs> She felt that was in the book, your spirit. Uh, well, you know, you can't help getting yourself in your artwork. Whoever you are, whatever kind of artwork you do, um, you, you always get something of yourself in it, in a simple way. Um, she's curious if you would consider uh, making what's called an artist book, which is honestly could be one of those sketchbooks if we put a cover on it. Um, they are artist books, but she was curious if you might consider doing that in a, a, a concentrated kind of way or a conscious kind of way, make a, an artist book and sell your work that way. 
and if that might be more satisfying because artist books don't need words in them. They just can be pictorial. Well, I would just make them as I have. Um, yeah. Wh whatever comes from me, I, you know. Yeah, I, I would explore that idea of Victoria. And um, her son, JJ, uh, is very interested in her work. And he's talked about making an animated film of her clay pieces. Wow. <laughs> oh, wow. That would be awesome. Which I think would be really fun. Yeah. Now, so that would be JJ's vision, right. but with Victoria's work. Right. So I could imagine somebody perhaps compiling her drawings with her um, uh, censorship or her overview to make artist books of her work. I could see that happening. I don't think Victoria would initiate that on her own at this point, but she might be guided right. in some way just to use what she has, you know. Right. And, and I have much more of these yeah. posted things that oh, I think they're a little bit different mm -hmm. now as my brain changes. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, her her drawings are changing also as as her work. She you can see. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Oh, Staten Island has been a, a a very lovely, nice place for me to do my work. Um, I lived in a railroad flat in Manhattan, <laughs> and I couldn't move in it. You know. So uh, the people ha are very nice here, and um, there's more sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to get sunshine in between the, the buildings. Right. <laughs> and nice doing artwork here. Um, you know, some things are made to last forever, and some things are not. Just so you know, they are all framed professionally with UV glass. Um, and, and we, the glue that we added is, uh, is archival glue, and the paper they're on is archival. So, but Victoria did want me to post that we, they should not be put in the sunshine. Yeah, the just like watercolors yeah. should yeah. not be put in the sunshine. Yeah. If you are going to display one of her drawings, you should be conscious to not have direct sunlight on it. Right. But nothing lasts forever. <laughs> no. Not even us, right? <laughs> we worry about our planet drawings. Uh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. You thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victoria. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> thank you, Charlie, Lenny.